Support me on GoFundMe if you want a real human voice for explanation. The link is in the description. Let's continue the video. This heinous story, which took place in England, has over the years become one of the country's most famous criminal cases. A young woman was murdered while walking in the park with her two-year-old son. The only witness was her child, and the police couldn't find the culprit for 16 years. When the case was solved, the police were accused of catastrophic unprofessionalism. It turned out that they had made a huge number of mistakes that had cost several lives. In this video, we will tell you how one murder story grew into something bigger over 16 years and how it all ended. Rachel Jane Nichol was born on November 20, 1968 in a village near Colchester, England. She grew up in a decent full family. Her father was an army officer and her mother, a housewife. From an early age, the young woman took part in various volunteer programs, helping the elderly and children with disabilities. At age 11, she enrolled at Holchester High School for Girls, where she was active in dance, singing and acting. All of her teachers insisted that the young woman had real talent and should develop in that direction. However, Rachel herself was more deeply into the study of history and English. After school, she got a job as a lifeguard at the pool in Richmond. Rachel later planned to try her hand at hosting a television program for children. In 1988, when she was 20 years old, Rachel met her future husband, Andre. The couple began dating, and a year later they had a son, Alex. Together, they moved to an area of London called Belham by then. She had already been offered a job as a model, but she decided to devote her full attention to her family for a few years and then try to get a job in television. On a summer morning, July 15, 1992, Rachel took her son and their Labrador for a walk in the Low Park. At the time, Alex was only a month away from his third birthday. This park in Wimbledon neighborhood was popular with the locals there were always a lot of people there during the daytime, mostly parents with children and dog walkers. Despite this, because of the large area and the abundance of greenery, it was always possible to get away from prying eyes and enjoy nature and solitude. Unfortunately, there was a downside to this at about 10.30 a.m. A woman walking in the park noticed a gruesome scene. A young woman was lying on the ground. There was a lot of blood around and a small child was sitting next to her. The victim was Rachel. Several dozen police officers arrived on the scene. They had to cordon off an area of four square kilometers where there were hundreds of potential witnesses and possibly the killer. Detectives soon realized that none of the park's visitors had seen either the moment of the attack or the killer himself. Number one except for one witness, Rachel's son, Alex, they were to get all the information from the two-year-old boy. Of course, this was extremely difficult to do. The child was first admitted to the hospital for examination to make sure he was not injured. Later, the detectives did get some information from him. He said he and his mother were approached by a tall, thin, white man with brown hair. Everyone in that park was questioned. It took the police almost an entire day, but it only took a few hours for reporters to get the whole country to hear about this gruesome crime. Rachel's case instantly caused a wide resonance which is not surprising. A young mother died in front of her child in one of the most popular parks in London. Residents of Britain were even more shocked when the newspapers leaked information from the pathologist's report. Rachel had been stabbed 49 times with a sharp object. There was enormous pressure on the Metropolitan Police. Society demanded that the sadist be caught and punished as quickly as possible. And detectives did indeed have to work at an accelerated pace. In the first few weeks, they interviewed 548 men. 32 of whom were even arrested for a short period of time. But all to no avail. The police simply had no leads. The only thing the experts were able to find was a tiny piece of organic material that they thought might be connected to the killer. But 1992 technology simply didn't allow them to study it. By September, investigators were left with no suspects, so they enlisted the help of Paul Britton, a renowned profiler to compile a description of the killer. 
Here's what he came up with. He is a man in his late twenties to early thirties, most likely living alone. All of his hobbies are also socially unrelated. He's interested in knives and the occult, and has sadistic fantasies in addition, he lives near the park. At the request of the police department, this profile, along with the sketch, was shown on television. After that, they received at least four calls, all with the same matching name, Colin Francis Stagg. In addition to the fact that he fit the sketch, the police ran his name and realized that he had already been on their radar. The fact is that Stieg had tried to enter the park the day Rachel was killed. Colin Stieg, 27, had led a secluded lifestyle. He had lost his job and was struggling to find money to pay for housing and food. He had a dog that he walked every morning in Wimbledon Common Park. According to his testimony, on the day Rachel was killed, he went there with his dog, but because of a severe headache, he quickly went home and went to bed. Toward evening, he felt better and decided to take his dog out for a walk again. However, on this approach to the park, he was stopped by the police. Stay calmly answered all questions and gave his details. The police had no evidence against Stieg, but he seemed to them to be a suitable candidate for the role of the killer. In addition, the press kept pressuring law enforcement agencies, and they needed a breakthrough in the case urgently. That same day, Stead was brought to the police station where he was held for three days. One questioned, he denied any involvement in the murder, but the detectives were beginning to believe more and more the opposite. First, the cult books were found in his home, which coincided with the profiler's suggestion. Second, the police were able to find two women who gave some disturbing details about Steg. One woman accused him of exposing himself in front of her in that very park. In his defense, Collins said he was just sunbathing in a secluded part of the park, and the woman came there herself. Another woman reported that she had been exchanging intimate letters with him for some time. In one of them, he confessed to her that he dreamed of having sexual intercourse outdoors. All this was already enough for the police to consider Colin a pervert and finally, believe his involvement in the murder of Rachel. Except they knew that all these circumstantial arguments would not stand a chance in court. For this reason, the man had to be released. On the advice of his lawyer, he agreed to pay a fine for exposing himself to a woman in the park though he continued to insist on his innocence detectives, along with a profiler, came up with a very unusual plan that was supposed to help force a confession. A Metropolitan Police officer, under the pseudonym, Lacey James, began writing column letters of intimate content. She said she knew the woman's stake had corresponded with before. Despite the ridiculousness of the situation, the plan worked Colin responded to all the letters and each time their dialogues became more and more explicit and perverted. Lizzie played the part of a woman with violent and sadist hobbies, sometimes even illegal, and their communication lasted five months. All this time, Stieg insisted that they finally meet in person, and the detectives decided it might actually help to get a confession out. The look patient end date was set at a park. Lizzie didn't go there alone, but Steg didn't know that. Plain closed officers were keeping an eye on them in case the man decided to attack their colleague. During the conversation, Lizzie, on the provider's advice, shared with Colin a fictional story about her secret hobbies. She revealed that her ex-boyfriend was into the occult and that they performed a ritual sacrifice on a living person together. Steg took this information rather calmly. At least he kept in touch with Lizzie, and they spent a few more hours together and parted ways. After that, they met a few more times. And finally, the police decided to move on to the final part. Walking in the park, Lizzie talked to Colin about Rachel's murder. She told him that she wished he had been the murderer because she was aroused by thoughts of the crime, but it didn't work. Steg apologized to her and told her that he had nothing to do with the murder. Lizzie tried to get him to confess several more times, but he kept denying his involvement. It looked as if the police had botched a six-month operation. They couldn't get any evidence that Stake had killed Rachel but the detectives were still convinced. They were right. 
That's why they did arrest him in August 19, 93. At the interrogation, Colin was told all the cards and that all this time he had been in correspondence with the police officer. He was read excerpts from these letters describing various perversions and was also introduced to the real Lizzie herself. Seed was shocked, but on the advice of his lawyer, refused to answer police questions. Investigators had hoped to the last that under such pressure, he would confess to the murder, but he did not. All they had to do now was to take the case to trial. All this dragged on for a year, which Stakes spent in custody. When the case finally went to trial, his lawyers blew the prosecution's arguments to smithereens. Even the judge was forced to admit that the whole operation with Lizzie James was overkill and that the police had behaved in an extremely unprofessional manner. In September 19, 94, Colin was acquitted of all charges and released. Lizzie James later resigned from the police citing serious psychological trauma from the operation. The police who had spent more than three million pounds on this investigation were deadlocked. They had not a single suspect, and most of the detectives continued to think the stake was the murderer, and they were not alone in this opinion. The newspapers and the public continued to blame him for what happened. Every time he went out on the street, he caught the embittered looks of passers-by. Almost the entire country believed that the murderer had gotten away with it, and this only added to the hatred towards Stag. This went on for years. The Rachel Nicole case was finally hung in the balance, and the police made little effort to look for new suspects. Why were they all sure of Colin's involvement? By then, Rachel's husband, along with Alex, had gone to live in Europe for several reasons. First, he was constantly harassed by journalists which reminded his son of his mother's murder. Secondly, the father felt it was not safe for his son to remain in London. He was the only person who saw the murderer. For a long time, no one knew which country they had moved to. Later, journalists did get wind that they lived in Spain and France. In 2000, Scotland Yard took up the case and assigned a new team to it. They studied all the collected material and witness statements but failed to find a new suspect. Only three years later, they announced that they had found DNA from an unknown man on Rachel's clothes. Analysis technology had only just matured to such a capability. And in 1992, such a discovery was simply impossible. Even in 2003, this tiny sample, which took experts 18 months to find, was not enough to establish identity. The data from that sample was only enough to rule out unsuitable people. And a year later, in 2004, the police finally had a new suspect. His DNA was already in the database, and a comparison with the sample from Rachel's clothes showed mixed results. That man was the 38-year-old Robert Knapper, a convicted murderer and serial rapist who at the time had already spent 10 years in the halfway house. His biography is striking in two ways, the cruelty of his crimes and the ease with which he evaded justice. Later, because of this, the police would face a wave of outrage from the public. Knapper first came into the hands of law enforcement in 1986. He was then given a suspended sentence for assault with an air gun. In 1989, he broke into a young mother's house and abused her. For the next four years, there was a series of similar attacks, but the police did not tie them together and could not reach the suspect. What followed was something truly amazing. Knapper confessed to his mother that he had carried out all these attacks. She called the police and told them everything. And what do you think? They found no connection between the crimes and the woman's story, so they didn't look into Knapper's involvement. The only thing the mother could do was convince her son to see a psychiatrist. When Napper came back from there, he said that the specialist thought he was crazy but took no further action. A short time later, he assaulted and abused a woman and her child in Crystal Palace Park. This happened just weeks before Rachel's murder, but again, the police failed to see the connection. This was by no means the only such attack in Crystal Palace Park and police at some point figured out that one man was committing the crimes. From the words of witnesses, they compiled a sketch of him. After the publication in the newspapers, 
several of Napper's neighbors contacted the detectives. They all pointed to the man, and the police called Napper for a blood sample. He simply ignored the request, and the detectives did not go looking for him. They simply forgot about him. In November 1993, London was rocked by another high-profile crime, which as it later turned out, was also committed by Napper. A young mother, Samantha Bissett, was attacked in her room. In addition, the perpetrator did not spare her young daughter. What he did to them shocked even experienced detectives. The police photographer who arrived on the scene could not return to work for several months because of the shock of what he saw. Remarkably, the same profiler who had been brought in to investigate Rachel's murder worked on all of these cases, and he believed that all of these attacks had nothing to do with each other. The detectives also saw no possible connection to the Rachel case because they were 100% sure that Colin Stagg was guilty. The team of investigators handling the attack at Crystal Palace Park also saw no connection. Napper was nearly 190 centimeters tall, and based on witness testimony, the perpetrator was shorter. But the maniac made one mistake in the attack on Samantha Bissett. He left a fingerprint in her apartment that allowed his identity to be run through the database. Napper had previously been fingerprinted after he stalked a woman in the street. He was not arrested until May 1994. When questioned, he denied guilt and was extremely calm. In his apartment, they found maps of London on which the locations of the attacks and murders were circled, including the place where Rachel was murdered. They also found several notes on how to properly abuse women. Shortly before that, police found a knife in the very park where Rachel was murdered. The fingerprints on the handle matched Napper's, but even that wasn't enough to make detectives consider him for the killer because they were still convinced Colin Stagg was guilty. Napper, however, was still considered a suspect in Rachel's murder for a while, but those charges were quickly dropped. The thing is that Napper said he was at work that day. In 1995, Napper went on trial for the murder of Samantha and her daughter. The prosecution struck a deal with him in which he pleaded guilty to manslaughter, and the court sent him to a closed psychiatric hospital instead of prison. The fact was that Napper had been diagnosed with a number of disorders, including Asperger's syndrome and schizophrenia. Because of this, the maniac could have avoided prison anyway, with or without a confession. As a result, the judge sent him to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital for treatment, with no time limit. Later, detectives wanted to question him about Rachel's murder, but the doctors forbade it. They feared it might aggravate Napper's mental status. Back to 2004, the new team of detectives on the Rachel Nicole case finally began to take a closer look at Napper as a suspect. After they compared his DNA to a small sample found on the young woman's body, the results were very mixed. That sample wasn't enough to confirm the similarity. It was only enough to rule out other suspects. In Napper's case, the results did not confirm with 100% certainty. Investigators kept digging further using new technology. On Rachel's clothing, they managed to spot a microscopic piece of paint. Experts examined it and concluded that it matched the paint on Napper's iron toolbox. Prior to his arrest, he worked as a storekeeper for the Department of Defense. It is not entirely clear how he could have gotten a job there with his set of mental disorders. Transcribed with audiototex.app by Gems on December 5, 2023, page 10 of 12. But the fact remains he combined assault and murder with his day job. It took Scotland Yard three years to prepare this case for trial, and in 2007, Napper was charged with the murder of Rachel Nicole. During the first hearing, he pleaded not guilty, which prolonged the trial for almost a year. In the end, Napper agreed to the same deal he had been offered 12 years earlier, a change of plea to manslaughter in exchange for a confession. On December 18, 2008, 16 years after the murder, he finally confessed. For Napper himself, the verdict did not change anything. He was left in the same hospital under heavy guard. Most likely, he will never be released. But the news made a lot of noise all over Britain. The police suffered the most, 
fixating on Colin Stagg and completely ignoring other serious leads. Instead, the investigation was divided into three separate lines. Each team of detectives looked for different criminals while behind all the attacks and murders was Napper. That same year, 2008, Stagg sued the police department for £706,000, a record for Britain, for unwarranted criminal prosecutions. The Metropolitan Police also issued a public apology to him. He subsequently wrote several books about his life experiences. In them, he described what it was like to be accused of murder. Stagg admitted that for 10 years, his life was effectively ruined by journalists and the police. After the whole of Britain finally believed in his innocence, he decided to spend all the compensation on travel, expensive cars, and other things that brought him joy. In 2010, a special commission issued a report criticizing the actions of homicide detectives. This document was called a Catalogue of Wrong Decisions and Mistakes. And the reason for this is not only the fact that the murder could not be solved for 16 years. The whole point is that if the police had done their job properly, they could have arrested Napper before he killed Rachel, Samantha, and her daughter. No disciplinary action followed. However, all of the detectives involved in the case retired, and one of the lead investigators passed away. As for Rachel's son, Alex, he did not give his first interview until 2017, 25 years after the incident. He said that growing up without his mother had been problematic, but that he had found the strength to let go and move on. Shortly before the interview, he went to the very place where his mother was murdered. And in that moment, he was able to finally let go of the heavy weight of the past. One can only hope that this story, like others like it, will serve as a lesson for law enforcement agencies around the world. It is too late to speculate about whether or not the police could have saved Rachel and Samantha, but it is never too late to draw conclusions and prevent future crimes. A 28-year-old woman mysteriously disappeared from her own home, leaving her bedroom light on. They had been looking for her for months. And at some point, the story began to resemble a detective series. The police had barely pursued the case, so the missing woman's parents turned to an independent team of former detectives, and it was only thanks to them that the gruesome truth came out. Kate Warren was born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. She had two brothers and loving parents who tried to give their children the best of everything. Kate demonstrated a love for animals from a young age and started volunteering at various shelters from her teenage years. She also danced, had many friends, and was a very positive person. It seemed to everyone that the woman grew up in a very good environment, and in part, that was the case. But one day, all of that changed. Shortly before going to college, she admitted to her parents that she had been abused as a child by someone close to her family. Apparently, she did not reveal his identity as this information is nowhere to be found. For Kate's parents, this revelation came as a real shock. They hadn't had the slightest inkling of what their daughter had been through for years. After the woman shared this terrible secret, her mother and father tried in every way to help her. But the consequences of such trauma over the years only worsened. First, Kate developed problems with alcohol and later with illegal substances. At one point, her parents suggested she get treatment, and the woman agreed. They also encouraged her to go back to their home and live with her family, which was also supposed to help her deal with her problems. At that point, Kate was an adult and living on her own, but she agreed to come home nonetheless. At first, it seemed like therapy was really having a positive effect. But Kate was still unable to let go of the heavy weight of the past and start living life to the fullest. The psychiatrist she went to diagnosed her with depression. But at one point, everything changed. Her father, who constantly supported his daughter and tried his best to help her, offered to take a trip anywhere in the world that Kate chooses. The woman was excited by the idea and soon decided she wanted to go beyond the Arctic Circle. Her dream was to see polar bears. 
Despite the sad experience, she still had a great love for animals. They set about looking for suitable tours and soon bought tickets. They were to get to the Arctic Circle by ship, and Kate couldn't wait for this exciting journey. At this point, her parents watched as her depressed state was replaced with a cheerful and positive attitude. When they finally went on the trip, Kate was over the moon. She and her father had a great time. The woman gained a lot of positive emotions. On the ship that took them to the Arctic Circle, Kate met another tourist from Russia. Throughout the trip, they communicated and continued to correspond at the end of it. Kate developed a liking for him, and sometime after his arrival home, she decided to go to Russia. There, they met again, and the woman even considered staying in the country longer, but she was prevented by problems with her visa renewal, and Kate was forced to return home. In spite of this, it looked as if the woman had finally managed to overcome her depression. She planned to solve her visa problems back home and even began writing a book for her children. It seemed like her life was finally getting better. But on Saturday, June 12, 2009, everything changed. On that day, Kate was home alone while her family was away on business. The woman always called her father to tell him that she was okay, but not this time. Her father decided to call her himself, but Kate didn't pick up. After waiting a while, he asked his wife to come home and check on his daughter. Given her past problems with alcohol and illegal substances, her parents were still worried. When she arrived home, her mother didn't find Kate there. But here's what was strange. The light in her room was on. It looked as if the woman had gone out for a while and would be back soon. The mother waited a few hours, but Kate was still gone. She also discovered that her daughter had left important medications at home that needed to be taken regularly. Despite their concern, the parents decided not to panic and wait for their daughter to show up. After all, Kate was already 28 years old at the time, and her parents understood that she could live her life. The father made the decision to wait until Monday, after which he wanted to call the police. On Monday morning, the father received a call from the bank. An employee told him that a man had come into their office and tried to cash more than $4,000 in a check signed by Kate Warren. They could not reach the woman herself, and her father acted as a fiduciary on her account. The whole situation seemed extremely strange. The father knew for a fact that his daughter had only a few hundred dollars in her account, and that was the reason the bank security service decided to contact him. That said, the woman's own signature looked authentic. They also gave the name of the man who had brought this check. His name was Ethan Mack. The father did not know him, but because of what the bank said about Kate's signature, he assumed that this man was indeed an acquaintance of his daughter. Despite this, he still decided to go to the police. Because Kate was still not in contact. Detectives began investigating the man's disappearance and the first thing they came up with were questions for Ethan. He stated that he had known Kate for years and that she had written him this check for her old debts. According to Ethan, he often gave her money for clothes, jewelry, and other purchases. After talking to Kate's acquaintances, the police did verify that she had been friends with Ethan for a long time. According to them, there had never been a romantic relationship between them, but they had always been close. Ethan himself said that he and Kate met Friday night and went out to eat at a restaurant. Afterward, he drove her home and left on his own business. He even showed the detective's correspondence with Kate confirming what he said about the dinner. Ethan allowed the detectives to inspect his home where he lived with his mother and his car. They found nothing suspicious. But the situation with the check still seemed odd to the police, and they were in no hurry to clear him. Eventually, Ethan called the police station and rather harshly asked them to leave him alone. The police attempted to reconstruct the chronology of that Friday evening when Kate was last seen. She went to see her therapist in the afternoon, then went to the gym. Next, she went to the store and bought a bottle of wine. Surveillance cameras recorded her talking to someone on the phone at that moment. According to the investigation, she may have been talking to Ethan 
who later picked her up and they went to a restaurant. The woman's parents recalled another disturbing fact. On the day of her disappearance, Kate told them she was in trouble. She refused to specify what it was about, and her parents didn't remember it until a few days later. Alas, none of this helped in any way with the surge. As the weeks passed, the woman remained unreachable. Her parents thought the police weren't doing enough from Kate's troubled past. In August, however, the case was given a new chance and a group of former police officers led by a lawyer named Andy Savage took on the case. This group had been investigating cold cases privately, and Kate Warren's case interested them. In all, the group consisted of five men, each of whom had extensive law enforcement experience. One of them was former Detective James Randolph, who first examined Kate's bedroom. There, he singled out two suspicious things. First, his attention was drawn to a package of medication that the woman was taking on a regular basis. Her parents assured him that she would never skip a drug of her own volition, and the fact that she had left the package at home was really alarming. Second, he discovered Chinese money on Kate's bed. This was strange. For the parents had not the faintest idea where the woman had got it or why she needed it. Next, a team member named Bobby Minter got involved. He specialized in collecting information about a person on the internet and tracking people down. His skills really came in handy. In no time at all, he found out that on the day of her disappearance around 10 p.m., Kate called her friend named James, but he didn't pick up the phone. Then the woman left him a very disturbing voice message. In it, she stated that someone had stolen her credit cards. He went on to find out that her phone was last active at 1.53 a.m. She called her own voice mailbox number for some reason. Bobby found out that the call was made from the James Island area, which was a few miles from Kate's house. Another member of the team, former homicide detective Eugene Fraser, also found out something interesting. He talked to several acquaintances living in James Island and found out something strange. Ethan Mack, who had volunteered to let the police inspect his and his mother's house, did not actually live there. He was renting an apartment in a building nearby. Eugene was very fortunate to learn these details. The fact is that a close acquaintance of his turned out to be the owner of the very apartment Ethan had rented. Digging deeper, the team of detectives realized that the police did not conduct any proper investigation of Ethan. They only took a cursory look at his mother's house and let it go at that. The team decided to look into the matter on their own. They discovered that Ethan had a girlfriend named Heather Camp. When they asked Kate's parents if they knew the woman, her mother recalled a rather strange story. Kate had met Heather a month before she disappeared. They were on the same train from Washington, D.C., where the woman was dealing with problems with her bees that are Russia. After meeting her on the train, Heather told her that her wallet had been stolen, and now she had absolutely nothing to live on. Kate agreed to help and loaned her a certain amount of money. Heather herself said she had gotten a job as a pediatric surgeon in South Carolina and should start in the next few days. A few days later, Heather stated that her daughter had been killed in a car accident in New Jersey. And here her behavior seemed completely illogical. Heather did not go there, and from her demeanor, it seemed that her daughter's death did not upset her much. The team of detectives discovered another curious fact. An Indiana fraud case had been filed against Heather. The reason for this was that she was posing as a licensed doctor, forging the necessary documents. Thus, the team gathered an impressive set of data that forced them to look at the case from a different angle. They turned all this information over to the police, but they were totally unwilling to investigate further. So the team realized their only chance to get the cops moving was to present them with unequivocal evidence implicating Ethan and Heather in Kate's disappearance. To achieve this goal, the team went to extreme measures. First, Eugene Fraser asked an acquaintance of his, who rented Ethan's apartment, to install a hidden camera in front of the door of his apartment. What's more, they installed a hidden GPS tracker on Ethan's car. This allowed the team to track his movements and see what he was up to. 
It wasn't long before it paid off. After setting Ethan's itinerary, the former detectives determined that he had been to multiple pawn shops throughout the city. They followed his footsteps and learned that at each of these pawn shops, the man sold various pieces of jewelry in small batches. Alas, they were unable to find out if the jewelry belonged to Kate, but the detectives felt they were getting close to a clue. After a while, they ran into a serious problem. The owner of the apartment where Ethan and Heather were staying informed them that he was going to evict them for non-payment. The team realized that if they did so, they would lose the ability to monitor their behavior and movements, so they made every effort to convince the owner not to do so. Along with this, the detectives urgently came up with a new plan. They asked the owner to give Ethan and Heather extra time to pay their rent. But on one condition, they both had to sign an agreement under which they would undertake to repay that debt in any case. This ruse worked. As soon as the landlord gave the team this contract, they immediately sent it to the lab. Their purpose was simple, to compare Ethan and Heather's handwriting with Kate's signature on the very check for $4,000 and here they had their long-awaited breakthrough. The specialist stated with absolute certainty that the signature on the check was written by the same person who had signed Heather on the contract. This meant that it was Heather who had forged Kate's signature, but the team was well aware that the lazy police still wouldn't want to listen to them. Something else had to be found, and they came up with a new plan. They convinced the landlord to play along until Ethan at the apartment needed to be treated for insects. The head of the team put on an exterminator suit and went to the apartment with the owner. Beforehand, the detectives waited until Ethan left the apartment, noticing that his car had pulled away from the house. James and the owner went inside, an unpleasant surprise awaited them. Ethan was at home. It turned out that Heather was driving his car but it was too late to call off the whole operation. So James had to change his plan as he went. They continued to stick to the legend of the need for disinfection and asked Ethan to wait outside the apartment while the dangerous chemicals were sprayed. Ethan, who suspected nothing, agreed and went outside. At the same moment, James began to carefully search the apartment for any evidence that might link Ethan to Kate's disappearance. James noticed Ethan's backpack and examined its contents. There awaited his first clue, Chinese money. As we recall, the same bills were laying on Kate's bed. Alas, that wasn't the end of his luck. James was unable to find any other potential clues. He and the landlord pretended to do the processing and left. The team needed a plan again. As they studied the camera footage in front of Ethan's apartment, they noticed that one man came in very often. He turned out to be a neighbor of the couple named Terry Williams. The detective speculated that he might know about Ethan and Heather's involvement in Kate's disappearance. So the team took a risky step. They decided to offer Williams an impressive sum of cash if he would tell the police what his friends had done to Kate. They took the bag of cash and went to Williams' apartment with this offer. But here the detectives had a rather unexpected twist waiting for them. At the time they knocked on William's door and told him about their offer, Heather was at his house and heard everything. Apparently, she was cheating on Ethan with Williams. After hearing the detectives talking to her lover, Heather panicked. She called Ethan and hysterically told her what had happened. The team didn't expect this scenario, and over the next few days, they tried to figure out what to do next. But then another surprise happened. Williams called them and invited them to his house for a talk. The detectives arrived at his apartment, and Williams spoke. He stated that Ethan and Heather had not told him anything directly, but he suspected that the couple had done something bad to Kate. He then picked up an iPod from the shelf and revealed that Heather had given it to him just days after Kate disappeared and Williams had assumed that the player belonged to her. The team examined the iPod, and thanks to the serial number, they were able to determine that it did belong to Kate. This set of clues was already enough to once again go to the Charleston Police Department. And this time, the local cops could no longer shrug off their job. After examining everything the team had managed to dig up, they finally arrested Ethan and Heather. 
At the first interrogation, Heather agreed to cooperate with the investigation on the condition that the police help her get minimal punishment. She stated that Kate's body was on Wadmala Island, about 20 miles from her home. Police enlisted a search party and combed the area all day. Kate's body was not there. It soon became clear that Heather had simply deceived them. Then Andy Savage decided to resort to another ruse. He realized that Heather was most likely directly connected to Kate's murder, but he met with her and promised to help. Andy offered her a deal. He would do whatever it took to get her off the check forging charges, and she would name the exact location of Kate's body. Heather is convinced that this is her only chance, and she agrees. She said Kate's body is still on the outskirts of Wamala Island, specifically near Polly Point Road. The woman also described a specific location. The team of detectives decided to go there without the police, and they were disappointed. They failed to find Kate, but they returned the next day, and it finally happened. The woman's remains were found. Medical examiners were unable to determine the cause of death, but soon the perpetrators themselves began to speak. In August 2009, Heather signed a confession to murder obstruction of justice, and bank check fraud. Police discovered that the woman had been a scam artist for years. And on that train from Washington, D.C., she chose Kate as her next victim. She later met Ethan and began dating him. As for Ethan, he was in no hurry to plead guilty, and a trial began in October 2010. Based on testimony from Heather, the prosecution reconstructed the chronology of events. According to their version, on the day of her disappearance, Kate learned that Heather had cheated her and also stolen her credit cards. Kate threatened to tell her father who would most likely involve the police. Heather told Ethan who sided with her despite her long friendship with Kate. According to the investigation, Kate had dinner that night, not only with Ethan. Heather was also present. Apparently, the couple was trying to negotiate with Kate to keep the cheating story from escalating. At the restaurant, Heather might have promised Kate to return the credit cards and money that had been in Ethan's apartment. When all three got there, Heather attacked her. The court questioned Heather's version and ultimately sentenced her to 39 years in prison. As for Ethan, he was a little luckier. He was sentenced to 25 years. This difference is due to the fact that Heather was also charged with fraud. What do we have in the end? Because of the actions of one fraudster, events unfolded that could give rise to detective movies. On the one hand, we have Kate who suffered severe trauma as a child, affected by alcohol and other substances. She found the strength to change her life for the better and overcame her depression. On the other hand, we have a sad fact in front of us. Her whole life was cut short because of a combination of betrayal and lust for profit. Ethan Mack had been her close friend for years, and for the sake of his new lover, he took part in her murder. There's also the police who did not do a quality investigation after learning that the woman had a history of problems with illegal substances. They put the case on the back burner. This is where people who had useful skills and a desire to seek justice came to the rescue. A group of independents did more than the entire police department, and it was only thanks to them that the killers were sent to jail and Kate's family was lifted from the shoulders, the heavy burden of ignorance. It's worth clarifying that not all of their methods are legal, but they did get to the truth. And what do you think? Are these mild violations justified? Is it possible to resort to surveillance and fraudulent searches to prove the involvement of a person in a murder? Write your opinion in the comments. A 19-year-old student was found dead in her own apartment during a fire, but the cause of her death was not fire at all. The detective knew immediately that they were dealing with a murder, but they had almost no evidence. During the investigation, the police had many suspects, but only one small and seemingly insignificant detail helped them solve the mystery. Missy Grubal was born on April 26, 1974, in the American city of Burleson, Texas. Her family lived very modestly, 
so in her school years, she got various part-time jobs to pay for her college education. In addition, she received good grades and was an active participant in the life of the local church. Even before her graduation, Missy decided that she wanted to become a teacher, and in 1992, she went to the University of Texas at Arlington. It was about 40 kilometers from her home, and Missy decided to rent a place closer to campus. What's more, she took two jobs to pay her rent and tuition without the help of her parents. But sometimes, even that wasn't enough to cover all her expenses. Once she had to skip an entire semester to earn more money during that time to continue her studies. Sometimes she also worked part-time as a nurse taking care of children. Despite such a busy schedule, Missy called her mother every day when she got home. It became something of a tradition for them. Her daughter would call her and tell her that she had returned from work, even if it was already nighttime. On the evening of April 7, 1994, Missy also called her mother. They talked until about midnight. The young woman was in good spirits and preparing to celebrate her 20th birthday, which was only a few weeks away. Around 3 a.m., the local police department received a call from Missy's neighbor who lived downstairs. She reported that there was a loud noise coming from the apartment upstairs, like broken glass and banging. She thought there might have been a robbery going on and decided to call the police. The squad arrived on the scene, and a few minutes later, the fire department received a call to the same address. It turned out that there was a fire in the house, so in addition to firefighters and police officers, an ambulance also arrived there. Upon arrival, firefighters evacuated the residence and proceeded to extinguish the fire. Given the building was small, they quickly managed to find the seed of the fire. It was the apartment on the second floor where Missy lived. When they entered the apartment, they saw a terrible sight. There was a young woman lying on the bed without any clothes on, and the fire was burning all around her. The firefighters immediately realized she was dead. So as soon as the fire was extinguished, the police arrived. They determined from the first second that the young woman had not died from the fire. They noticed several stab wounds on her body, which caused a lot of blood on the bed. As for the fire itself, firefighters immediately opined that it was purposeful arson. Moreover, when they first arrived at her apartment, they smelled a strong odor of gasoline. After examining the apartment more thoroughly, the firefighters were conclusively convinced that they were dealing with arson. Someone had poured gasoline all over the apartment and left leaving the dead young woman inside. However, the perpetrator had closed the front door, which made the extent of the fire not as large. There was not enough oxygen in the apartment to keep the flames burning. The police quickly identified the deceased as Missy Grubo. In the meantime, her body was handed over to medical examiners, and they conclusively confirmed that the young woman had died before the fire started. This was confirmed by the stab wounds on her body and the lack of smoke traces in her lungs. If the victim had been alive when the fire started, even when she was unconscious, she would have inhaled smoke, and the experts would have noticed it. They also determined that the young woman had been abused and were able to extract a sample of the perpetrator's DNA because of it. The police found a knife in Missy's apartment, which they believed was the murder weapon. Unfortunately, no prints were left on it. Apparently, the killer had washed it in the sink before setting the fire, nor could the DNA from the victim's body help them get a lead on a suspect. In 1994, there was no way yet to load that data into the database to match the DNA of previous convictions, but the police had their first lead almost immediately. It turned out that a week before her death, Missy had filed a police report on a co-worker she had worked with at the coffee shop. A young guy had lost his place and was looking for someone to stay with for a while until he could find a new apartment. Of all his co-workers, Missy was the only one who agreed to help and let him stay with her. She even gave him a spare set of keys so he could leave and return regardless of her. The co-worker only lived there for a few days. One day, Missy came home from work and was about to put the tips she had received for the day into the piggy bank. 
she kept saving small amounts to add to her tuition and rent, and by then, she had almost a thousand dollars in her piggy bank. But that day, the young woman discovered that all her money had disappeared. She immediately blamed her co-worker since no one but him had spare keys. He denied guilt, but Missy threw him out and reported him to the police. But when they started looking for him, the guy had quit his job and disappeared. So the investigators had a pretty good suspect. The guy had keys to Missy's apartment, so he had no problem getting in. When he found out the young woman had gone to the police, he might have held a grudge against her and decided to get revenge. If he didn't know that Missy had already gone to the police, he might kill her just to keep her from doing it. While the cops were searching for this guy, they started working on another clue. Letters from a certain young man had been found in the victim's apartment, and judging by their contents, he and Missy were having some sort of affair. They didn't live very far apart, but they exchanged letters regularly. The young woman was a deep believer and had never had a boyfriend before. She also mentioned in her letters that she wasn't ready for any kind of intimate relationship until after marriage, and her companion was of the same opinion at first. But over time, the contents of his letters became increasingly intimate, and Missy wasn't happy about it. The detectives decided to run the man through the database and, to their surprise, discovered that he had a prior conviction for violent acts. Given that Missy had also been abused before the murder, this was enough to make the young man a suspect. He was found and questioned, but he denied any involvement, but he had no solid alibi. The boy said he was sleeping alone in his house at the time of the murder. However, Missy was killed between midnight and 3 a.m., so his alibi didn't seem all that dubious. But the detectives were in no hurry to drop the charges and asked him to volunteer a DNA sample. The guy agreed, and they let him go. Unfortunately, in those years, DNA analysis took more than a month, and it had only been a few days since Missy's murder, so detectives had to wait at least a month for experts to isolate the DNA profile from the victim's body and then wait another month to compare it to the guy's sample. So investigators began looking for other leads. And soon, they had a third suspect. The management of the cafe where Missy worked told them about an incident that had happened shortly before her death. The young woman complained to the manager that one of her co-workers named Jeff had stolen some items or money from the cash register. The theft charges were confirmed, and the man was fired. Afterward, he caught up with Missy and began accusing her of losing his job and leaving him without a livelihood. During this conversation, he said he was going to kill her. The police also discovered that Jeff had tried to win Missy's affections, but she rejected him. This also may have served as an additional motive. All this was more than enough for the police to question the man. But while the detectives were trying to find out his address, something unexpected happened. Jeff's girlfriend came into the station and said she was afraid of her boyfriend and suspected him of killing Missy. It turned out that the man had not been home the night of the murder, and he had never told his girlfriend where he was since then. She also said that Jeff had a very bad temper and often exhibited outbursts of aggression. The man repeatedly mentioned the story that he had been fired because of a complaint from Missy, and he had been furious about what he had done. When he did get found and brought in for questioning, he acted very brazen. Jeff kept smiling and bombarded the detectives with various stories that were at odds with reality. He claimed that, in fact, Missy was obsessed with him and wanted to date him. And that was why his girlfriend had gone to the police to get revenge. He also stated that he was at home with his girlfriend the night of the murder, which contradicted her story. When the detective said that his girlfriend denied this alibi, he just laughed. That said, Jeff did agree to provide his DNA sample voluntarily. Given that there was no evidence against him, and the DNA analysis could have taken over a month, he had to be released. But a few days later, Jeff's girlfriend called the police. She was extremely disturbed and told them that the guy had kidnapped her from her parents' house and held her hostage for eight hours, threatening to kill her if she tried to get away from him. Eventually, he let her go, and the young woman immediately contacted the police. 
They immediately began to search for Jeff, but by then, he had already escaped. In spite of this, the detectives were almost certain that he was behind Missy's murder. They put out a search for him on a kidnapping charge, but the man seemed to have vanished. Meanwhile, experts at the lab were able to determine the blood type of the owner of the DNA sample found on the victim's body. They also had samples from Jeff and Missy's boyfriend, and both had a different blood type. This came as a surprise to the detectives. They were almost certain that Jeff was the killer, but the data from the lab disproved that theory. Thus, they were left with only one suspect who had not given his DNA sample and who had not yet been found. A colleague of the victim who she had allowed to stay with her. However, a month had passed since the murder, and the police were still unable to track him down. But suddenly, they had a new lead that no one was expecting. Missy's mother called the investigators and said she remembered a strange detail the young woman had told her on the phone a few days before she died. She didn't give it much thought and didn't decide to share it with the police until a month later. As mentioned earlier, Missy sometimes worked as a nanny, and one of her regular clients was a young couple who lived in the same complex. They had a young child, and the woman was pregnant with her second. Her partner, Louis Arroyo, also worked in the same restaurant as Missy, so they often saw each other and talked. According to the mother's story, a few days before her daughter's death, the man came to Missy's house to talk. Even though it was getting close to nightfall, she let him in. Lewis told her that his relationship with the young woman had been strained lately, and that he just needed someone to talk to, but what followed was something that struck the police as extremely strange. Missy told her mother that after the conversation, they got into a mock pillow fight. It was hard for detectives to imagine a 32-year-old man and father coming to a 19-year-old young woman's house near midnight and then having a pillow fight. But according to Missy's story, that's exactly what happened. In a conversation with her mother, she didn't give it much thought, but the police decided to check on the man. They found out that Lewis had no criminal history, had served in the army, and was a model employee at the restaurant. But after talking to his co-workers, the detectives learned a very interesting fact. Of course, after Missy's murder, the restaurant employees were constantly discussing the subject. And one day, Lewis said, I hope they catch whoever killed and raped Missy as soon as possible. A little later, he added that they might never find the culprit because all the evidence was burned in the fire. The problem was this. The police never disclosed that the victim had been abused before she died. It wasn't in the newspapers or reports. It wasn't even reported to her mother, so the detectives had a logical question. How did Lewis know about it? One question the man stated that he and Missy did talk a lot, but that he had nothing to do with her murder. He was calm and forthright in answering all of the police questions until the detectives asked him for a DNA sample. At which point, Lewis became visibly nervous. He asked why they needed his DNA since the fire was supposed to destroy all traces of the perpetrator, and his sample would have nothing to compare it to. You have to agree. That sounds pretty strange. It is worth noting that the police also did not close the fact that the experts received a sample of the killer's DNA. Therefore, no one knew whether they had this evidence or not. After these words, the detectives explained to Lewis that they had a sample of the killer's DNA, and the man's behavior changed dramatically. He said he urgently needed to take his child somewhere and left the station, promising to come back the next day to take the DNA test, but he never came. A day later, the police went to his workplace, but the man was no longer there. The manager and his girlfriend called and asked to give Lewis a couple of days off because he had to leave town. Along with this, the detectives discovered another interesting fact. Lewis had married his girlfriend the day after he was questioned. At this point, they could only guess what was behind the move. But first, the investigators decided to talk to his wife. She said that on the day of the murder, Lewis called her from work and said he was going to a bar with friends. He came home around midnight, took a shower, and said he was going for a run. He returned after 2 a.m. 
and his wife noticed that he smelled strongly of smoke and gasoline. The man was also coughing constantly, and his nose had traces of soot in it. His wife asked him what had happened. Lewis then told her that he had run by Missy's house and noticed the fire. He went up to her apartment and saw that the place was engulfed in flames, and the young woman herself was lying on the bed. Lewis tried to save her by giving her artificial respiration, but the smoke and flames forced him to run outside. Apparently, his wife was quite satisfied with the story, and they went to bed. As you have already realized, the detectives found a number of suspicious points in the story. Even setting aside the fact that the man decided to go for a run in the middle of the night, his further story defies any logic. First, how could he have gotten into Missy's apartment without keys? After the fire, forensics determined that there were no signs of forced entry on the door. This means that Missy let her killer in on her own. And according to Lewis's story, he entered her apartment when she was already dead. Second, if his story is to be believed, he had just seen a dead young woman. He had known for a year and a full-blown fire in the house next door. But instead of calling the fire department and the police, he decided to just go to bed. His wife apparently didn't see fit to do anything about the situation either. The police also learned Lewis's blood type from his wife and matched the blood type found on the victim's body. All of the above was enough to put a man on the wanted list, but his whereabouts remained unknown. The wife also asserted that she didn't know where her husband had gone, but the detectives didn't believe her. By then, they suspected that the woman was deliberately covering for Lewis. In their opinion, he had told her a greatly altered story about the murder in which he had no choice or Missy had attacked him herself. In other words, he had convinced her under some false pretenses not to cooperate with the police. But everything changed when the detectives told the woman that Missy had been abused before she died. Almost immediately thereafter, Lewis's wife told them where he might be. At about the same time, police officers from the city of San Antonio found a burnout car that belonged to Lewis and that his mother lived in the same city. Detectives went there and found the man himself after which he was arrested. At the station, he acted extremely tense lying on the floor, crying, and generally looking like he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. But during his interrogation, Lewis stated that he had indeed gone to Missy's apartment that night and had been intimate with her in a consensual manner. This account did not go well with the fact that the young woman's body was found with many wounds and bruises, not to mention the fire. Next, Lewis's story became frankly bizarre. He said he didn't remember how events unfolded after that, but he may have stabbed her while denying that he had set the apartment on fire. The man did not actually deny his involvement in the murder, but he did not confess either. This made the detective's job difficult, but now they could take a sample of his DNA. At that point, they already knew that Lewis's blood type matched the killer's, and all they had to do was wait for the DNA results. Sometime later, the experts found a perfect match, and Lewis was charged with murder. Given that he did not actually confess directly, the case went to trial. The man continued to insist that he and Missy had a consensual intimate relationship that night. As for the murder, he continued to give some vague version. Lewis supposedly had no recollection of stabbing her, but did seem to recall taking a knife from the kitchen. He said the same thing about the fire. He remembered that there was a fire in the room, but he did not start it himself. According to the investigation, Lewis had long had a liking for Missy, and in some ways was even obsessed with her. In favor of this, one interesting fact, the man had worked in the same restaurant as Missy for almost a year, and he had moved into her compound six months before the murder. Considering that there were hundreds of similar complexes in their city, it would be logical to assume that Lewis had chosen this particular place for the sake of living closer to Missy. In addition, in the days before the murder, he had visited her around midnight for no meaningful reason, which also seemed odd to the investigators. According to their version, on the night of the murder, Lewis had gone to her apartment for the purpose of inducing Missy to have intimate contact. The young woman, 
who was a virgin at the time and was saving herself for marriage, rebuffed him, and Lewis flew into a rage. He abused her then killed her and went to get gasoline. After setting the apartment on fire, he returned home and told his wife some made-up story in which he made up what had happened as an accident. Perhaps the story about the run-in, the attempt to save Missy, came about only after investigators began to suspect Lewis and informed him that the fire had not destroyed the killer's DNA. Upon learning this, Lewis could have convinced his wife to tell the police how he had tried to save the young woman with CPR. Apparently, his wife really didn't know the truth. She was also not charged in any way. Detectives speculated that Lewis had married her only that she would be legally entitled not to testify against him. As for Lewis himself, the court sentenced him to life in prison with the possibility of petitioning for parole in 2034. Apparently, he had hoped for a reduced sentence recounting his memory loss that night and not directly denying that he could have killed Missy. But the court concluded that he had long sought to seduce the young woman and eventually decided to commit the crime. After which he saw only one way out, to kill Missy to avoid prison. Thus, the police were able to solve a very complicated case in which, of the four suspects, the most unobvious was the culprit. They only drew attention to him thanks to Missy's mother who decided to share a strange but insignificant detail. Perhaps Lewis would have gotten away with it if it weren't for that little detail. And lastly, as for Jeff, he was found after all and jailed for four years for kidnapping his own girlfriend. Share your opinion on this story in the comments. A freshman at a prestigious university disappeared without a trace after a sports match, leaving her open car and keys in the parking lot. The police did not investigate the case, thinking that the young woman had simply run away, but her parents and friends knew that something terrible had happened. For 12 years, the mystery remained unsolved, and only after all this time did the truth come out. Shannon Melendi was born on October 20th, 1974, in Miami, USA. Five years later, her parents had a second daughter, Monique. From an early age, the girls were taught that their first priority should be to get a quality education. This approach had a strong influence on Shannon from the first years of school. She studied only excellently while finding time for various clubs and sections where she excelled. In high school, Shannon firmly decided that she wanted to tie her future career with politics or law. She headed the school debate club, and in her last year of school, she even made a speech to the U.S. Congress and the General Assembly of the United Nations as part of special training programs. After these events, she finally decided she wanted to work on the Supreme Court. To achieve this goal, she needed a good legal education. Shannon's applications to several of the country's top universities were accepted, and she chose Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, due to its reputation and the annual grant of $15,000 for the first four years of study. After graduation, she moved to Atlanta to study political science. The university made a great impression on her, and she quickly settled in and made many friends. Despite the grant, Shannon also got a part-time job at a softball field a few kilometers from her dorm. On March 26, 1994, Shannon had to quit her job because of an error by her supervisor. That morning another employee was supposed to keep score, but the young woman was accidentally added to the schedule and agreed to work the game. Shannon arrived at the stadium at about 8.40, and four hours later, her shift was over. Usually, after work, she would stop at a nearby gas station to buy a soda, but that day, she left and was never seen again. The stadium management expected her to return after halftime to turn in her scorecard, but she never did. Her friend and roommate, Athena, was the first to sound the alarm. At first, she was alarmed when Shannon didn't return to her dorm in the evening. She had nowhere else to sleep and was unlikely to stay with anyone. After not waiting for her roommate the next morning, she decided to call her parents to see if she had contacted them in the last 24 hours. Shannon's parents were at work at the time, so her younger sister came to the phone. 
She told Athena that she hadn't spoken to Shannon in the past few days and promised to ask her parents when they got home. Athena became increasingly worried and told two mutual friends about the young woman's disappearance. Then they decided to look for her on their own. They got in their car and started to drive around the campus. Eventually, they reached the stadium where Shannon worked, and there, a disturbing discovery awaited them. As they approached, they noticed a gas station near the stadium and to their surprise spotted Shannon's car there. It was a black Nissan 280SX that her parents had given her. As they pulled up to the gas station, the friends found the car empty, but the keys were in the ignition and the doors were unlocked. All this only increased their anxiety. Shannon would never leave her car, much less with the keys and the doors open. Shannon's parents immediately went to Atlanta to participate in the search after learning that the police were unwilling to investigate their daughter's disappearance. They contacted former President Jimmy Carter, who secured FBI involvement in the case. The parents printed and posted thousands of flyers, and Shannon's father rented a billboard, announcing a reward of $10,000 for any information that would help find the young woman. Detectives identified several suspects among Shannon's acquaintances, but quickly became convinced of their innocence. Three days after the young woman disappeared, an unidentified man called the police on the hotline number listed on the flyers about Shannon's disappearance. He stated that the reporters had made a mistake in reporting on the young woman's disappearance, and said that Shannon was going to hold her as long as he wanted. Despite the caller saying that he had kidnapped Shannon, law enforcement continued to believe that the young woman had run off somewhere. This went on for several more days until an unidentified man made a second call on April 6th. This time, he called the university's counseling center and said that Shannon was at his place and that she was fine. He promised to call later to make demands for her return. Finally, he said he would leave Shannon's ring for the police near where he was calling from to confirm his words. This event led to law enforcement finally reclassifying the disappearance case as a kidnapping. The police department appointed a new lead detective, who noted the unprofessionalism of his predecessors. Almost all of their actions were flawed. They did not take fingerprints from Shannon's car, instead asking a stranger to drive it to another location. They also did little or nothing to investigate the case since they thought the young woman had simply run off somewhere and would be back soon. With this in mind, investigators decided to work every possible lead from scratch, and the first thing they focused on was the softball field where Shannon was last seen the day she disappeared. Complicating the situation was the fact that several weeks had passed since the young woman had gone missing. In addition, there was a championship game on the field that day, bringing the total number of visitors and participants to over several hundred. The detectives attempted to question as many people as possible, urging them to recall any suspicious moments at the game. To their surprise, many told the same story. The only oddity at that game was the behavior of the referee, Colden, Butch, Hitten. According to the players and stadium staff, he was extremely dismissive of his job, distracted all the time, including during key events. Instead of doing his job, he was constantly trying to talk to Shannon and ask her out. The detectives began to dig deeper and discovered that Butch had left the softball field at almost the same time as Shannon. After talking to his co-workers, they found out another strange thing. The day before the game, he had asked the other umpires to fill in for him at that game because he was supposed to have a date that day. They all knew that Butch was married, but he stated that his wife was out of town for a few days. When all his co-workers said no, he called his boss and asked him to leave the game early. He explained that his brother's wife was in the hospital, and they had no one to leave the children with. On that day, Butch returned to the stadium two hours after he had left, and was still wearing his officiating uniform. He went into the locker room, changed, and left. Three hours later, he returned to the stadium where he was spotted by a colleague. When asked what he was doing there, Butch said he had forgotten to give his paycheck to the accounting department, but he didn't have his paycheck with him. Moreover, Butch asked his colleague if he had seen where his car was parked. 
For a man who had just arrived at the stadium, that question sounded very strange. Investigators questioned Butch, and he denied any involvement in the young woman's disappearance. According to him, after the club, he went straight home. As proof, he showed detectives several outgoing calls from his phone made less than 40 minutes after leaving the stadium. He was offered a polygraph interview. Butch agreed and failed it. Almost all of the answers were deemed false, but it wasn't enough to arrest him. It was, however, enough to obtain a search warrant for his house, which incidentally was located near the burger joint where the police found the Shannon ring. Detectives discovered two other curious facts. His neighbors said that he had lit a fire in the early morning hours after the day Shannon disappeared. Later, the man called his father and asked him for a handsaw stating that a tree had fallen on his car. Detectives went to his house with their service dogs, but they were unable to find any sign of Shannon's presence there. However, an interesting discovery awaited them on the property. They noticed three places with overgrown soil. When they dug them up, they found something really creepy. Under the ground were dozens of items of women's clothing and shoes, as well as a sleeping bag and some softball field scorecards. Experts examined the excavated clothing, showed pictures to Shannon's parents, and concluded that none of it belonged to the young woman. Butch himself said he had no idea where on his property such hiding places came from. He assumed that all left over from the past owners of the house. In the end, the police were in a tricky situation. A lot of facts pointed to Butch's involvement in Shannon's disappearance. But at the same time, there was not a single direct clue against him. They hoped that a more detailed examination of the young woman's car would bear fruit. But here too, they were out of luck. Because the police did not take fingerprints and look for DNA samples on the first day of the investigation, the experts were not able to find them. But they came to an interesting conclusion. Someone had thoroughly wiped down the car, destroying any potential traces. In an effort to find some hard evidence against Butch, one of the detectives dug up a really interesting fact. He examined the bag containing the Shannon ring and discovered that such items are not manufactured for retail sale. He contacted the manufacturer and learned that the only buyer of such bags in the state of Georgia was Delta Airlines. The company itself stated that the bags were used by mechanics to store small airplane parts. And as we recall, Butch worked as a mechanic for that very company, and that's not all. The detectives went over the whole thing so thoroughly that they found another tiny clue. In Butch's car, they found a piece of the same duct tape in which the pouch had been wrapped. On the tape itself, the experts found microscopic particles of the same metal. After studying its composition, they concluded that this compound is used only in the aviation industry. In spite of all this, the case was frozen for many months. The police and Shannon's parents were sure that Butch was behind the young woman's disappearance. But no one could prove his involvement. All the evidence was circumstantial. As soon as the airline learned of the suspicions about the man, they quickly fired him. Before that, he had managed to brag mockingly to his colleagues that he was a suspect in a case of kidnapping a woman. After reviewing his background, investigators discovered that Butch had quite an impressive criminal history under his belt. They didn't know this at the beginning of the investigation because there were no advanced criminal databases back in the 90s. It turned out that he had committed his first crime when he was still a minor. He got a part-time job and one day went to his boss's house where only his wife was there. Butch tried to tie her up, but he failed. The woman then convinced him that if he left, she wouldn't tell anyone what had happened. He believed her and left the house, and the woman immediately called the police. Butch was arrested, but due to his age, he was only ordered to undergo involuntary psychiatric treatment. This, despite the fact that he admitted that he wanted to abuse the woman. The next time he went to the police was for kidnapping a 14-year-old young woman when he was in his 20s and had a wife. He called his younger brother's ex-girlfriend and told her he wanted to meet her. He assured her that his younger brother would be with him except he came alone to the meeting. Then Butch said that his brother asked him to give her a gift. 
He asked her to put her hands together, then wrapped a rope around them and took the young woman to his house where he locked her in the basement. It is unknown how the story might have ended, but Butch's wife accidentally discovered the victim and called the police. The young woman told investigators that Butch molested her. But despite this, he was only sentenced to four years in prison. The victim also shared some very disturbing information. Butch told her that if she didn't comply with him, he would do to her what he had done to the previous two, whatever that meant. Released early, less than two years later he remarried. His new wife was unaware of Butch's criminal past. The police believed these were far from all of Butch's crimes. Buried women's clothing indicated that he may have had other victims that he did not leave alive. Shannon's investigators were never able to get any charges against Butch in the case, so they continued to look for any potential evidence, but to no avail. In December 2003, Butch was released early from prison after spending eight and a half years there. In all that time, the police could not come close to charging him with kidnapping Shannon, but they were somewhat lucky. While in prison, Butch frequently hinted to other inmates about his involvement in the case and many of them agreed to testify against him. Detectives interviewed about ten inmates. One of them, Adonis Cornwall, said he woke up in the middle of the night to a scream from a cellmate Butch. He said in tears that he had not killed Shannon. The demons inside him had done it for him. He asked the other inmates what the chances were of going to prison for murder if the victim's body was never found. To one of the inmates, he almost confessed what he had done. Butch told him that he had left the softball field with Shannon and that the police had been extremely stupid for not examining her car properly. He also said that her body would never be found because it had been scattered in the wind. This testimony, combined with all the previous circumstantial evidence, gave investigators a chance to bring the case to trial. Six months later, in August 2004, they finally arrested Butch for the first time on charges of kidnapping and murder. According to the investigation, Butch saw Shannon at a gas station and, under some pretext, lured her into his car. Next, he threatened her to drive to his house or he drove himself. Given that his past known crimes have been committed with knives, it could have been the same in Shannon's case. He then locked her in the house and drove back to the stadium, parking the young woman's car at the gas station. He left the keys in the ignition, wiped off all prints, and left. When he returned home, he could have abused the young woman, killed her, and then disposed of the body. Few people believe the court would convict. I think everyone is familiar with the phrase, no body, no case, and in the vast majority of cases, it fully reflects reality. It is extremely difficult to prove that a person committed a murder if no one has even seen the victim's body. At the time, there was not a single case in Georgia where a court had convinced a person without a body. But investigators went to great lengths to squeeze the most out of the circumstantial evidence they had. They even brought him prisoners to the trial who heard hints of Shannon's murder from Butch. He himself insisted on his innocence. After the trial was over, the jury could not decide on a verdict for three whole days. But eventually, they made the decision and found Butch guilty of murder. Consequently, the court sentenced him to life in prison. He was 43 years old at the time, and in theory, he should have spent the rest of his life behind bars, but there was one unpleasant nuance. The perpetrator was eligible to apply for parole every seven years according to the statutes in effect at the time of the murder. Bush tried to challenge the court's decision, but he failed. Two years later in 2006, something really unexpected happened he decided to confess to the murder. His story was almost exactly the same as the prosecution's. He saw Shannon in the parking lot and suggested she go to Burger King for a bite to eat. Shannon agreed, and they drove there in his car. After eating lunch, they drove back to the field. Only Butch missed the right turn, stopped the car and said his leg was cramped. He asked Shannon to drive and got in the back seat. There, he pulled out a prepared knife and threatened and forced the young woman to drive to his house. There, he tied her up and told her he wasn't going to hurt her. 
Butch said he only wanted to sell her car, after which he intended to let her go. She behaved calmly and did not try to scream or fight back. Leaving her tied up in the house, Butch returned to the stadium, drove Shannon's car to the gas station, and left the keys inside. He did this in the hope that someone would steal it, and it would help throw the police off the scent. After thoroughly wiping the steering wheel and other places where he might have left fingerprints, Butch returned home. He abused the young woman and left for the movie theater with his nephews and their parents. Apparently, this family outing he had originally planned as an alibi. When he returned home, he abused Shannon again while constantly repeating that he would let her go as soon as he sold her car. He then allegedly began to realize the gravity of what he had done and tried to figure out what to do next. He went to bed but woke up a few hours later and began to panic. Then he went down to Shannon's house, put a tie around her neck, and cut her off. According to Bush, she was asleep at the time, and it all happened very quickly. Next, he spent hours wondering what to do with the body. By morning, he decided to burn it. Built a large fire and added fuel, putting the body there. He changed his clothes and went to the service at church. When he returned home, the fire had allegedly destroyed all remains. The man said that the unbearable weight of the guilt made him confess to what he had done, but it was hard to believe. First, he made two taunting calls to the police and the university, telling them that Shannon was alive while he had already disposed of her body. Second, he planned to kidnap another woman, his wife's best friend that day. As soon as his wife went out of town, he called her and asked her to come over. Allegedly, he and his wife wanted to meet her, but the friend refused, which saved her life. Knowing this, can we speak of any remorse and guilt on the part of Butch? In addition, he stated that the fire had turned the body to ashes in a matter of hours, which seems impossible. According to the man, when he came home from church, there was no trace of Shannon. He allegedly waited for the ashes to cool, gathered up the ashes, and dumped them on the railroad tracks. Most likely, he lied and had to bury the remains, including the bones, somewhere. But why would he do that? The only option here was that Butch realized he might never be released and decided to play the remorse game. But if he had pointed out where the body had been buried, his sentence might have been altered and denied him the opportunity to petition for relief. He continued to insist that the fire in his house was really caused by a broken vacuum cleaner, despite the traces of fuel that experts found. As of now, he is still in prison and his next petition for parole can be filed in 2025 when he will be 64 years old. Shannon's parents continue to fight to ensure that he is never released. The only question that nags at investigators to this day is whose belongings were buried in Butch's backyard. Was he involved in the deaths of other young women, which could number in the dozens? Share your thoughts on this story in the comments. A 16-year-old girl went out for a run and disappeared. The police launched an investigation that would eventually last for 38 years. When the truth did come out, people were literally shocked. It turned out that the case could have been solved in just a few weeks, but instead, it took almost four decades to find answers. In this video, we tell you what happened to Joyce McLean. Joyce McLean was born on September 4, 1963. When she was young, her family moved to a tiny town called Millinocket, located almost on the edge of the United States. From an early age, she had a passion for music. The girl quickly mastered several instruments, but her favorite was the saxophone. She loved to compose her own compositions and was a member of the school music group. In addition, she was a member of the cheerleading team, played soccer, and in general, was a very active participant in school life. At the end of the summer vacation in 1980, Joyce was preparing for her approaching age of 17. She had only recently received her driver's license, and she planned to go to the lake shore with her friends and relatives to celebrate her birthday. She was even going to invite a local musical group to celebrate her birthday. Joyce had two more grades to finish, 
after which she planned to go to college. The girl was preparing for this in advance, so she studied only with honors, as well as earning various sports and musical achievements. On August 8th, she and her friends spent the day at the lake, after which she decided to go for a run. Joyce loved sports, but running was not her favorite activity. In spite of that, she was going to play in high school soccer games during the new school year, and she made every effort to keep herself in shape. The girl went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. Normally, she would run with her friend, but she was busy that night. Joyce had a standard route. She would do a few laps on the road that went around her tiny town. It usually took about an hour. But that night, the girl never made it home. Several hours had passed since Joyce had left, and her mother was beginning to get seriously worried. The girl always let her parents know where she was going. And if she had gone for a walk with friends after her run, her parents would have already known about it. Her mother decided to go looking for her and drove around town in her car. She asked around all the neighbors who came her way, but no one had seen Joyce. Considering the vast majority of the people in this small town knew each other, a few more people joined the search. Night was approaching, and the girl was still nowhere to be found. Then the concerned parents decided to call the police. Local officers immediately joined the search, and in the hours that followed, more and more citizens took to the streets. They combed the route Joyce was running, as well as the area behind the school. Unfortunately, there was no sign of Joyce. With each passing hour, panic increased, and there was little hope of finding Joyce alive and unharmed. It was the middle of the night. The police had completely ruled out the possibility she might have gone out with some friends. The problem was that everyone she knew was at home and later joined the search. Joyce's parents simply couldn't imagine their daughter deciding to go out alone until very late at night. They were unable to locate her, and the search dragged on for two days. During that time, police officers, along with residents, continued to explore the area until they finally made the heartbreaking discovery on August 10th. Joyce's body was found just 60 yards from the school playgrounds not far from the trees. The girl was lying on the ground. Virtually all of her clothes were missing, and her hands were tied behind her back with a piece of blue cloth. The police immediately realized that the victim had been hit hard in the head, but a more detailed analysis was to be done by a medical expert. After examining the body, they concluded that the girl had received multiple blows to the head, and that her death occurred on the evening of the same day she disappeared. Despite the almost total lack of clothing, the unknown perpetrator did not abuse her. Unfortunately, no other information could be obtained. There were no foreign DNA samples on the body, and even in the early 1980s, the technology was only in its infancy. The first person in history to be convicted thanks to DNA testing was not arrested until 1987 so the police were forced into a complex investigation with a minimal set of clues. Shortly after the discovery of the body, officers discovered Joyce's clothes, but that did not bring them any closer to a solution either. News of the brutal murder quickly spread through the town, plunging it into a very grim state. As is usually the case, the inhabitants of such tiny towns in the middle of nowhere had never encountered a murder. Adding to the anxiety was the fact that the killer was still out there. His identity remained unknown. Given the complete lack of evidence, several theories swept through the town. The most popular was that Joyce's body had been found near a place where less fortunate youths congregated. They often drank alcohol there at night and also took illegal substances. People thought that a group of such tipsy guys might have molested Joyce and things got out of hand. The police even checked with locals who regularly spent time in those companies, but they were unable to establish their involvement. Another theory was that the killer might have been a man who came for seasonal work. Hundreds of people came to this area on a regular basis since there were not enough local people to fill all the jobs. But even here, the police could not find any evidence. Some even began to suspect the volunteer who discovered Joyce's body. 
The fact was that he had spent most of his time surveying the area in tandem with another volunteer. On the morning of the last day, however, he went out to search alone. Because of this, there was a theory that he was involved. But even here, the police could not confirm his guilt. There was another version. It turned out that the same night Joyce disappeared, there had been a serious accident not far from the city. A 19-year-old local resident had snuck into a garage and stolen a gas tanker before crashing into another vehicle. He sustained serious head injuries and slipped into a coma for nine days, making it impossible for the police to question him. And when he woke up, he pleaded not guilty. The investigators didn't know what to do next. They had no evidence or witnesses. As a result, the case went into a long drawer for years during which time the police were unable to get any closer to a clue. Eight years later, Joyce's relatives created a petition calling for coverage of their daughter's murder on a national unsolved crime show. This would get the word out to viewers across America and draw the attention of potential witnesses. There is always the possibility that someone heard or saw something but for some reason did not report it to the police. The petition gathered 6,000 signatures, and the authors of the program agreed to do their own story. It was broadcast in 1989, and the police did indeed receive a lot of appeals, but all of the collected information turned out to be either erroneous or outright false. Unfortunately, this happens in almost every well-known case. People either make mistakes or simply lie and fabricate non-existent facts, forcing the police to waste time and resources on checks. The case stalled for several more years, but all the while Joyce's mother continued to fight for the truth. In the mid-2000s, she decided that new technology and techniques in forensics could help uncover evidence that had been missed in the 1980s. To do so, experts needed to exhume the victim's body, but there were challenges. Initially, authorities denied the mother's request for an exhumation. They believed that in almost three decades, any possible evidence simply had not been preserved. But the woman continued to insist. And in 2007, she managed to move the issue from the dead point. The medical expert Peter Cummings of Massachusetts contributed greatly to this effort. He was born in East Millinocket and was only five years old at the time of Joyce's murder. Despite such a young age, he remembered well the horror into which his town had been plunged. Peter admitted that it was these events that guided him into the field of forensics and medicine. When he learned that the authorities had rejected Joyce's mother's petition for an exhumation, he contacted her and asked her not to abandon the idea. Peter believed that the remains might have been preserved enough to try to extract evidence from them. He also contacted one of the leading forensic experts in the United States, and he took an interest in the case. Joyce's mother decided to take the initiative and organize an independent examination. The exhumation required about $20,000 from their own funds, which the family did not have. But they had the support of concerned people who, after so many years, still remember the case. With their help, the family quickly raised the necessary amount, and the exhumation took place in 2008. To the surprise of many, experts did unearth some important evidence. But at the time, they kept this information secret. Investigators only said that the discovery would not be followed by an immediate arrest, but the police immediately reopened the case. A few months later, it was reported that unidentified people had desecrated Joyce's grave. The police said they did not know if it had anything to do with the murder investigation. The next major twist came a year later in 2009, and that moment may have been pivotal. As law enforcement announced the prime suspect for the first time in 29 years. Let's take it back to 1980. A few hours after Joyce's murder, a local man stole a gasoline truck, got into a serious accident, causing him to fall into a coma. That man was 19 year old Scott Fournier. In 2009, he was put on the bench for possession of illegal material with minors. It seemed like the two cases were unrelated. Except after the sentencing, the judge suddenly announced Scott as a person of interest in the Joyce McLean murder case, 
urging the man to confess to what he had done. This news greatly surprised Joyce's relatives. They were well acquainted with Scott and knew that the police were considering him as a suspect because of that accident. But why had a judge officially declared him a person of interest after a long 29 years? The lead detective in the case declined to comment on the situation. He only said that they had made significant progress since the exhumation and that the investigation was well underway. Scott was sentenced to six and a half years in prison for possession of banned material. It was a minimal sentence despite having a criminal history. He was tried in 1979, 1980, and 1984 for theft, but all of those crimes occurred too long ago to affect the amount of time in the current case. He also came under the police radar in 2001 when his six-year-old daughter complained that he was molesting her. Although law enforcement believed the girl, the crime could not be proven, and Scott was not punished. All of the above already seems enough for a man to be seriously considered for the role of Joyce's killer. But as it turns out, that's just the tip of it and gets much scarier from there. Unfortunately, the case dragged on for several more years while the man was in prison. Investigators kept the evidence they had gathered under wraps and interviewed possible witnesses. In 2015, they assembled a team of 10 men and again surveyed the area where Joyce's body had been found. At the end of the search, they gave no details, but a year later, everything fell into place. On March 4, 2016, police officially announced the arrest of the suspect. Scott Fournier, who had only recently been released from prison, was taken into custody and charged with the murder of Joyce McLean. Scott was already 55 years old at the time, refused to plead guilty, and the case went to trial. He spent nearly two years in jail awaiting his first hearing because he didn't have $300,000 for bail. The trial didn't begin until 2018, and the public finally learned something really strange. It turned out that Scott had repeatedly confessed to killing Joyce just weeks after the fact. On one occasion, he cried and confessed to his mother and sister that he had killed Joyce. On other occasions, he told a local priest, an acquaintance of a married couple, and a co-worker of his. Some of these confessions did not reach the police until years later, but some became known almost immediately. Scott was questioned, but he began to deny his guilt. The guy referred to the head injury he sustained in the accident. According to him, he really thought he killed Joyce but now believes that, in reality, it never happened. He was questioned a total of 27 times, and Scott kept changing his story. At first, he told the police that he killed Joyce by stabbing her several times with a glass insulator from a power line that was lying nearby. The girl was indeed killed right under the power line. Scott further stated that he tied her hands, abused her, and fled. The police were confused by one fact in this story. Firstly, they were unable to identify the exact murder weapon, even though a glass insulator was found near the body. Second, Joyce had not been abused, as the medical examiner's report attested. But otherwise, his story was very close to the truth. In the following interrogations, he stated that he had killed Joyce in the company of other guys. Then he said he had just watched them attack her. He then changed his statement again and said that these guys forced him to participate in the crime. There were many stories like this, and during the investigation phase, the detectives just got confused. They had no hard evidence against Scott, and his story changed every time they questioned him. For this reason, he was not arrested all these years. It was only in time that they managed to gather enough evidence to bring the case to trial. Two witnesses helped in this a priest and a colleague of Scott's who both heard him confess. The colleague asked the guy how he got away with it. Scott replied that he had simply filled the police with false accounts of other people's involvement and that it threw them off the scent. A colleague reported the conversation to his superiors but not to the police. Apparently, they never passed the information on to law enforcement. He admitted to the priest that he did not abuse Joyce because she was on her period at the time and that was a key factor. The police never divulged this information. 
although they became aware of it after examining the girl's body. It turns out that Scott simply could not have known such details unless he himself was the killer. Scott's attorneys insisted that all the evidence was circumstantial. They wrote off their client's confession to the head injuries sustained in the accident. They also cited the fact that the police did not arrest the man immediately after he first confessed to the murder. In addition, the attorneys rebuked to the court for refusing to consider other suspects. For example, they tried to pin the blame on the man who discovered Joyce's body, Peter Larley. That morning, he was to go and search for the girl paired with another volunteer. They had arranged to meet at 6 a.m., but Peter never showed up. Later, the volunteer learned that he had gone out early and found the body. But there's an odd point here, too. This volunteer's sister lived next door to Peter, and on the morning of that day, she saw the man leave the house at dawn. According to the woman, he had a large gym bag in his hands. And when he returned home after finding the body, he looked happy and smiling. This story seems dubious if only for the reason that the volunteer did not report all of this to the police until 16 years after the murder. That already seems strange, and it is impossible to verify the authenticity of his words. Unfortunately, Peter Larley died of a heart attack just two days before Scott's arrest. For this reason, no one will ever know why he came out earlier, but the police said that there is no evidence that he was involved in the murder. The prosecution denied all the arguments of the lawyers. They assured him that the police had looked at all possible suspects and had not been able to find even a hint of their involvement. Scott, on the other hand, gave many reasons for suspicion. Even his stepfather told the police early in the investigation that he suspected Scott a murder according to him. A few days before the incident, the boy said he planned to start running in the evenings. He also mentioned that he felt sympathy for Joyce. Moreover, when Scott first confessed to the murder, he was asked to show where he had attacked Joyce. The boy led investigators to the exact spot where the body was found. They cited several other witnesses to corroborate the theory that he was involved. On the evening of Joyce's murder, at about 9 p.m., the couple saw Scott run by the scene of Joyce's murder with a bottle of liquor in his hands, except according to them, an unknown young man was running beside him. They didn't know at the time that's where the girl's body would be found, but they later reported it to the police. An hour and a half earlier, Two local teenagers had also seen Scott and an unidentified young male running through that area. The trial lasted just over two weeks, and the final verdict was handed down on February 5, 2018. Scott was found guilty of Joyce's murder, sentencing him to 45 years in prison. At the time, the man was 57 years old, a sentence that virtually guaranteed he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. In 2019, Scott's attorneys appealed, which helped them schedule a new hearing. The court, however, did not change the original sentence. According to the judge, the evidence against the perpetrator was exhaustive, and all the arguments of the defense had no weight. Joyce's relatives lifted from their shoulders the heavy weight of ignorance that had been with them for 38 years. All that time, they had fought for the truth, and it was her mother who contributed the most. This woman dedicated her life to getting justice. Eventually, she went even further and helped pass a law that enabled the authorities to start allocating substantial funds for the creation of unsolved homicide squads. One obscure point remains in the whole story. Who was the other guy seen by witnesses? Scott's involvement here is almost obvious. He knew so many details that the police never disclosed publicly. It just can't be written off as conjecture. But what about the two groups of witnesses who told the police the same thing? Could it be that Scott committed this crime in the company of some other person? This point is also questionable. After Joyce was killed, Scott stole a gasoline truck and had an accident, but he was the only one in the car. Where did his supposed partner go? Is it possible that they separated immediately after the murder? And yet, the version of the second killer seems dubious. Share your opinion on this story, and don't forget to like if you like the video. Thanks for watching.